guys. Um, so we're into the like really end part of MS100 now. Um, these two videos are going to be on digital media, gender and sexuality and why this is important, why these issues are important for us to cover. And the reason why I do that is these are perennially important issues and they're perennially popular issues amongst media students. So it's important that you have a kind of basic grounding in some of the issues around this. Obviously, I've tailored it towards digital because that's my area of expertise. But this um, material around gender um, and I really concentrate on gender here. And you can go away and ha have a look at some of the material on sexuality as well, because in most of the texts about media studies, they don't conflate these issues, but you find a lot of material about both of them at the same place. I'm going to concentrate mostly on gender, though. Um, and yeah, this is an, it's not just a perennially popular issue. It's a perennially a critically important issue today as much as it's ever been. So um, yeah, issues with gender are extremely important and we do need to have an appreciation of them. So in these two um, videos, I want to look at what is important about gender and sexuality in media studies. Um, the concept of gendered media and gendered platforms, that's very important to me as a theorist, and I think it's something that we all need to get to grips with. The effect of gender in media development and issues around harassment, um, the Me Too movement and Gamergate as well. So obviously a focus on digital media there, right? And we can begin by asking ourselves, you know, why would we need a feminist perspective in media studies? And there is a hell of a good reason. Now, Let's have a look at some of these genuine advertisements from the post-World War II era. I mean, some of these are great, right? Uh, <laughs> look. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks. What? Now she can cook breakfast again when you prescribe new morning dine. <laughs> what? You mean a woman can open a ketchup bottle? Wow! And the one with the spanking is just, oh my god, oh my god, it's horrendous. Um, of course, these are um, extreme examples of representations of women in advertising in this case, right? But... I mean, let's be let's be perfectly obvious. All right, so maybe the misogyny is not as blatant uh, in contemporary examples, but women are still treated as objects of desire, objects of sexual desire for men, mostly in a lot of advertising. So, you know, are things any better? Things might be different. That doesn't mean they're better anymore. But obviously, through the history of media production, there has been a need for a feminist perspective in media studies because women have been represented in such awful ways throughout the history of the media, quite frankly. So the questions we should really ask ourselves is what do those adverts say about women? Um, and we could, you know, you can be dismissive and say, OK, they are a historical artifact of a different time. But to do that dismisses how there is a line of representation of women over time, which, you know, the form might change. But the underlying attitude towards women as being second class citizens within in the eyes of the media maybe doesn't change, you know. Um, and then we think about, you know, how, you know, going back to the first principles of this module, how the media constructs reality. What we have, therefore, is a social construction of gender um, and social constructions are shared concrete conceptualizations of a group in society that is normative and accepted. So it is sort of a hegemonic position and ideology, which is hegemonic. See how I'm using all the terminology from the module? Damn. Um, and we should ask ourselves if the situation is different today, because, OK, maybe the representations are different. But does the media construct gender in ways today which are similar? Women are subservient to men. Women are... Um, around to please men, you know, and the role of women in society is to give pleasure towards men. And that's really what those adverts at Root are all about, right? That women should be there to do either do things that men don't want to do or to look in a particular way for your men folk. Okay. Now, if we ask that question about Hollywood cinema, we ask it about television production, we ask it about the music industry in particular, we ask it about advertising, are we really so enlightened? I'd like to think perhaps some things have changed, 
But actually, I'm really sceptical, and I think that the vast majority of media output is still of a similar kind of form. You may disagree, uh, and we can talk about this in the seminar, obviously, but um, I think it's a very important issue that, you know, as a starting point for thinking about issues within gender, within the media, and feminism and representation of women in particular, I think this is critically important. You might ask at this point in time, OK, Leighton, why are you doing a lecture about gender and it's all about women? <laughs> um, well, when you have a patriarchal system, you don't really have to worry about the representation of men. And if there are any people who are thinking, well, men should be treated, you know, men should have the same treatment. Uh, just open your eyes and look at the world, I'm afraid. Um, I'm not even going. OK, so feminism. Um, I'll just give, you know, an incredibly brief review here. Right. So um, we usually talk about um, feminism in the concept of waves different waves of feminist thought over time. So the first wave, beginning in the 19th century and running into the 20th century, where the focus was on women's suffrage, i.e. The, the democratic rights of women and women's ability to vote in elections. And the scope of that was in the United States and the UK mostly. Um, the second wave really comes about in the 60s and runs up to the 80s, where the focus of uh, feminist thought at the time was on both official and unofficial inequalities within society. So both laws and rules, which meant women weren't treated equally, and structures of society, which meant women weren't treated equally as well. So this is when that concept of the patriarchy becomes very important, this sort of underlying set of rules in society, which aren't codified, but which see men as being superior to women in any given society. This is really a little bit wider than the USA and UK. It's a European and North American um, sort of movement. Now, the third wave, which emerges through the 90s, has different kind of focuses and different scopes. So really looking at um, how feminism can impact at the edges uh, of society rather than perhaps at the core of society. So looking at the sex positivity movement, um, post-structuralism and how to define feminism outside of a structural system, transnationalism and feminism, but radiating really from the traditional centre to the periphery. So ideas and groups which might have been marginalised even under feminism previously become a focus of feminist thought in the third wave. Um, there's some arguments that there's a fourth wave of feminism um, emerging today, but one of the problematic aspects of defining things in, this, in these terms is that it's very hard to concretize those definitions while something is happening. But if you're interested in this thing, obviously, there, you know, there's a great amount of um, literature being produced on feminism constantly, but on contemporary feminism too. So, you know, please follow your interests up that way. Why do we have feminism in media studies? Well, I'm just using news for an example. All hard news is about men. When you look at the news in the evening, the vast majority of stories, on if you watch the news, I mean, I look, he, he, <laughs> media lecture shouldn't be saying this, right? But I hardly ever watch the news anymore. Um, I find the news incredibly stupefying and dumbed down. Um, but when I do watch it, it is largely about men. You know, um, the stories are about men, people on it are men. Even if the presenter's a woman, um, most of the comments and so on come from men. There have been attempts to equalize this out, but they haven't been very successful. Um, if you look at this, uh, I've taken these um, figures from um, Paul Hodkinson's book. So 17% uh, of the world's news subjects were women. That means 83% are men. Women are least likely to appear in news stories about politics, government, business, or the economy. Because, of course, as we know, women aren't really important in those areas at all, right? Oh, my God. Um, women were much more likely to appear in news stories about health, social issues, art what you would actually call soft news as opposed to um, hard news. And here you go, bylines by gender. So, um, you, well, you know, <laughs> this is uh, on a typical Saturday in 2012. And you can see, um, remarkably, the newspapers that do best in terms of um, gender balance are the Telegraph and the Times. But um, actually, even they have a huge imbalance towards men. So. News is male. And look, <laughs> the entirety of media, to a certain extent, has a male bias to it. You know, um, it, it's very difficult to um, 
to classify it in any other ways. I, I used to work with people who were really into podcasting. And I had a colleague who I worked with who was a film lecturer. And um, we, we used to kind of laugh at this podcast and stuff because we both found podcasts really stupid in some ways as, as a sort of academic area of study. And um, I asked her one day, you know, okay, there's something else going on here. You really, really hate podcasts. What's going on? And she said, well, it's just another bunch of white guys studying stuff that white guys enjoy and white guys listen to. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I see that. You know, I get that, you know, and of course there are podcasts by women and there are podcasts for women and women are an audience for podcasts too. But primarily it's a medium made by men, consumed by men and talked about by men. Um, and that's just, you know, I'm just taking it away from uh, news media here and plugging into a different area. You know, if you think of video games or something, hell, it's completely dominant. Well, well like female there aren't any female game players. Well, okay, I know that there are, you know, I, I know that there are. I know that it always have been as well. It's, it's not like a new thing, you know, back when I was a kid, you know, girls of my age played video games just like, just like I did. But there's complete underrepresentation of that sort of thing. So, I, you know, there, despite any gains that have been made, there is still a significant issue with regards to both the representation of women and the amount of representation of women in the media in, as a, in general and therefore there is a need a definitive need for feminist media studies so why do we have feminist media studies then well we know that the media is involved in agenda setting and a patriarchal ideology could be embedded in seemingly non-ideological objective neutral and non-gendered media texts and helps to maintain the hegemony of patriarchy in real life and indeed, sexist messages in media could socialise people, especially children. And I'm not saying, um, not going into the media effects debate, saying, you know, sexist messages make kids into misogynists. But it can socialise children into thinking that dichotomised and hierarchical sex role stereotypes are natural and normal. And it's not just the media that's at play here. You know, there's been a long debate about, like, you know, the kinds of toys that children play with and um, the kinds of... Um, roles children are expected to um, assume in play when they're children, which normalises particular sex role stereotypes. But I just, I, you know, and I've done this previously, right? I point at Disney with this. Disney is massively guilty of normalising hierarchical and um, dichotomised sex role stereotypes in its texts. And kids love those texts, you know, and it is a really bad example, you know, and a feminist. Review, you know, analysis of um, Disney, for example, would not particularly be particularly <laughs> um, good for Disney. So I'm just going to rattle through some of the um, key sort of ideas in me uh, feminism, uh, feminist media studies that you can utilise and pick up straight away. Now you're going to have to read around these because I'm only doing these literally on a slide each, um, but I think it's useful just to introduce them. Excuse me. So, uh, Betty Friedan and the Feminist Mystique from 1963, I'm using the republished version of 2001, um, argues that the media presents a feminine ideal, a particular form of domestic suburban housewife, the happy housewife heroine, socially accept, and that is the socially accepted image of what a good woman is. And magazines in the time and content at that time naturalised the idea that the woman's normal sphere of operation is actually separate from that of men. It's the home, whereas a man's sphere of operation is the workplace or you know, the bar or somewhere like that. You know? And therefore, the influence of women's activities is less socially valued. Now, we might obviously society has radically changed since the early 1960s. Right. And um, women's place in the workplace now is is secure at least, albeit we still have major issues around, you know, the gender pay gap and so on. And, you know, we shouldn't underestimate any of that. But still, you look at advertising today and it's still largely women doing that kind of work in advertising. It's still seen as a realm of the woman, the home, rather than the realm of the man. Um, so this problematic issue, you know, Although we could say Frieden's talking about a different time, actually, I think that feminine ideal still exists and still permeates, even though it's not perhaps as explicit as it was at that time. 
Um, if we look at uh, Myra McDonald's work um, in representing women from 1995, um, she looks specifically at advertising and there's three constructs of feminine identity in advertising discourse. The capable household manager, the guilt-ridden mother and the self-indulgent flapper. <laughs> they were not self-contained categories of actual women but manufactured versions of feminine responsibilities or aspirations that have particular resonance for women of the period. So she's looking at that historical period that I was looking at earlier and really what McDonald says is that um, advertising discourse and media discourse in general constructs women. Now and I've talked about this in terms of discourse when we, um, in, in, around Michel Foucault and when I was talking about power and ideology and these things and how we construct subjects in, um, but through discourse. And really, McDonald's taking that kind of Foucauldian approach here and arguing that there are three types of idealised version of women that are constructed in advertising discourse, which then become archetypes for women in society, right? So you've got the capable household manager. That's the best one. The guilt-ridden mother is... The woman who should be at home looking after the kids but has to go and work and that's a bad thing and that still plays and the self-indulgent flapper the woman who is not married and doesn't have children and is basically a waste of space and you might think actually that that one is really really harsh and representations of that change but if you look at kind of movies like um uh, the train wreck is one that I can think of. Bridesmaids is another one. All of these sort of women that portray, or films I should say, that portray women who aren't married and don't have children as reckless, irresponsible drunks who sleep around all the time. That self-indulgent flapper is still an archetype that's used today. And it's like, what? Do you, you, you need a child and a man in order to be a woman? Well, hmm... <laughs> or maybe maybe to be a good woman. So again, McDonald's insights, albeit they're an analysis of a media which is in a context and time which is now different to ours, perhaps, these ideas still have, you know, real validity. Uh, Tuchman, the symbolic annihilation of women by the mass media. I mean, this is fascinating to me, um, really, it, in terms of how we look at how women are just not presented in the media is very important. We have to look at the concept of absence. There are rel relatively few women are portrayed in mass media, certainly compared to men. And there's condemnation within that. The women that are presented, working women are portrayed as condemned. And, you know, in terms of that as well as trivialization, working women are symbolized as childlike adornments who need to be protected or they are dismissed to the protective confines of the home. So really, in looking at uh, film in particular, but also, you know, culture in general, women are defined by two things. Uh, one, by their absence, and those who are there are condemned as being not good. Wow. And that is what we call the symbolic, remember going back to the semiotics uh, lecture, right? You know, um, the symbolism here, the use of signs to condemn an entire gen uh, gender and annihilate an entire gender in terms of importance. Harsh stuff. I think in terms of representation of women, maybe um, from 1978 when the original work came out, we, we do see more representation now. And so perhaps this notion of symbolic annihilation on the side of absence is not great, but I think on the side of condemnation, there are still major problems here and trivialization of women's role in society as well. So I think there still is a symbolic annihilation, but it is tipped perhaps away from um, absence into these other areas. Andrea Dworkin, a hugely um, influential second uh, wave feminist, um, very, very, in, very, very focused on the representation of women uh, and um, the effects of sex role stereotyping, in particular in pornography. And we, we haven't really spoken about pornography in um, this module, and you won't really talk about it much in your media degree, which is bizarre because it's one of the most consumed forms of media in the world. I've recently um, published a paper on virtual reality pornography in the journal Porn Studies, and it's a bit of an odd one that because um, I won't be really encouraged to use that as key reading or to publicise it too far. There's still a stigma around these things. Dworkin was extremely interested in pornography, not just pornography itself, but how pornographic codes and pornographic forms are reflected in society and in other media as well. 
So really, in, in an analysis of pornography, this is in the 1980s, women, the prostitute versus men, rapists, batterers, plunderers and killers. And the effects of sex role stereotyping in pornography is that pornography violates the civil rights of women. Pornography socialises men into acts of rape and sexual violence in their real lives. And the pleasure of the male requires the annihilation, and we see that word again, annihilation of women's sexual integrity. And the ideological implication of all this is that physical possession of the female is the natural right of the male. The reason why I draw on and talk in here is we live in a highly, what we could call, um, porn inflected society, you know. Uh, widespread and freely available pornography has been with us for many, many years. And the representations, the continuing problematic representations of men and women, even in mainstream pornography, still map on to those categories that Dworkin identified in 1981. And therefore, Dworkin, I mean, we don't have to agree with Dworkin's argument here, but I think it's certainly in terms of how pornography presents relationships between men and women that that ideological implication is right. Now, Dworkin's solution to this problem was to censor pornography, and I, the reason I don't, I'm not going to disagree with her point here because only because I don't think it's something you can either agree or disagree with. I don't think it's feasible. That's 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 actually why I'm, I've got a problem from. I don't think you can ban pornography. I, I don't think it's possible to do it, but. Um, I think what we can do is map on what Dworkin's insights are here in terms of how pornography structures sex roles. And therefore, does that is that reflected in other media? And it is at times. And is that a reflection of how, you know, sex and relationships are seen? Obviously not. I'm, I'm not going here towards healthy relationships, so you know, respectful individuals or something, but we know there are problematic aspects of relationships out there, and I think Dworkin's work has some um, validity in helping us understand the role of the media, which includes pornography. Pornography is part of the media, it's not some, like, you know, out there thing, you know, pornography is part of media. Um, on a similar theme, but on a very different way of looking at it, if we look at Laura Mulvey's seminal work uh, from 1975, Women as the Image, Men as the Bearer of the Look, Mulvey defines this term, the male gaze, um, and I've used that shot from Mad Men, because they actually deliberately use Mulvey's kind of ideas in Mad Men uh, to structure how Christina Hendricks' character was kind of is always stared at and where she's always stared at in the room and i mean I, by I mean, what i mean by where is where on her body she was always stared at so um what mulvey comes up with is two categories you've got the male gaze versus women to be looked atness pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female so it's men that do the looking it's women who are looked at and that this is how the media structures our view so an active passive heterosexual division of labour as similarly controlled narrative structure in terms of voyeurism, men versus women, sadism versus masochism and stuff like that. So a female audience basically for media text, does it share the male gaze? Is it excluded from visual pleasure? Um, or is it a mixture of things? Does the male gaze become a normalised way for women also to look at other women and therefore judge them on the same criteria that men judge women? which is really, really problematic, right? So Mulvey is very, very important. She's What she's talking about really is how the media structures the way we look at women. And we look through this male gaze. Women are framed, women are positioned, and women are emphasized in ways that please men, not that please women. And this is highly problematic. Angela McRobbie from 77, um, looking at feminism and youth culture, looking at how young women in particular are coded and the codes of romance, the importance of heterosexual relationships and the personal um, domestic codes of so competitive individualism. So the code of fashion and beauty is what um, McRobbie says is one of the most critical ones. Appearance is more important than personality or intelligence. And she looked very much at um, things like uh, music videos and looked at how young women are positioned uh, in in relationship to the musician and there's always unequal relationships. So McRobbie's work 
is really important in terms of like how the media constructs these codes. Constructs codes by presenting young women in particular ways. So fashion and beauty is always more important than their personality. So they've always got this competitive individualism. Young women are always up against one another because you don't want women having solidarity of any kind because that would be problematic for men. And women, in order to be pleased, a repetition of the Disney code here, they have to be in a heterosexual relationship. Not no relationship and not a homosexual relationship. It has to be a heterosexual relationship. And these codes of presentation of young women become internalized by women. Kind of problem. Right. If you've got Hayward and Drake's um, third wave agenda, and we sort of move into the third wave here, the second and third waves of feminism are neither incompatible nor opposed to one another, but the third wave agenda embraces the second wave uh, critiques of beauty culture, sexual abuse and power structures, while emphasising ways that desires and pleasures such as beauty and power can be used to enliven activist work. What we see in third wave feminism is a subversion of some of these things. One of the, you know, an interesting element of it is, um, and this is by no means widespread or um, as common perhaps as people think, but some third wave feminists, for example, have reappropriated sex work as a, as a positive thing in terms of um, body positivity and in terms of female empowerment in general, whereas second wave feminists, as you saw with Dawkins' work, for example, although she's at the extreme end, would be completely against pornography, for example. Some third wave feminists move the other way and say that pornography can be repurposed and repositioned to be pro um, feminist. Now, it's a difficult argument and it, it's a difficult example in some ways, and there are a lot of counter examples to this. But this isn't sort of emblematic of some of the ways that third wave of the third wave agenda has sort of re um, if you like taken back some of the elements that second wave feminism identified as being so problematic. Another example of this kind of thing is um, uh, Rosalind Gill, for example. She looks at the sexualization and culture and the extraordinary proliferation of discourses about sex and sexuality across all media forms. This is really a focus for feminism in the media now. But what I've used here is, is sort of an example of what I mean by a third wave turn. You know, the, here is somebody who is complaining about um, the advertising used by Burger King in, I think it was Australia, could have been the United States, but I think it was Australia. And obviously, in we see here, you know, the um, advert is vile, basically. Um, uh, but it's repurposed in, in the image. I love giving blowjobs to sandwiches with the look of utter contempt, which I think is brilliant. I just think, like, yeah, that's what I love to do with my time. That's me as a modern woman today. That's what I love. Thanks, Burger King. And it gives an example of how third wave feminism has done this kind of thing. OK, so I'm going to stop this here and then talk a little bit more about digital media in video, too. Cheers, guys.